Now, depression in the workplace has been recognized in recent years as an extremely costly condition. And I might add, one of the reasons why depression costs so much is it tends to start early in a person's life and it tends to recur. So there is an ongoing cumulative cost. We know from uh, studies done in the United States that approximately 80 billion dollars um, are, co are cost or lost in the uh, year because of depression. We are making headway in many ways because more people with depression are in the workforce, but they're often inadequately treated. We have a concept, obviously, of absenteeism, but presenteeism is the concept of people being at work but being functionally uh, impaired. So there is a significant cost to depression. This is a, an issue that many people uh, probably don't think much about. If you have depression as an illness, your chances of dying from heart disease are roughly double. Your chances of dying from stroke disease are doubled. Now this is Swedish women, but I could have shown you figures for men from different countries. This holds true. And if I looked at some of the most recent journals, the question keeps on being asked, why if somebody has had a heart attack in the last month, if they show symptoms of depression in the days or weeks after the heart attack, why are they more likely to die in the next six months? And why is depression a greater risk factor than being a cigarette smoker? Well, there are many reasons uh, that relate to some of the biological changes in the body that are associated with depression, changes in our immune system, changes, for example, in platelet stickiness in our blood that are associated with depression. So I think it's important to spell out that depression goes beyond the brain in terms of its uh, implications. Now, how do we do with current treatments? Uh, I looked with some colleagues a few years ago at our success rate, actually at the Clark Institute, with people who came for treatment. And these figures are fairly representative of uh, other centers. When we look at the highest goal, which is treating people to remission, where they don't have any depressive symptoms, roughly a third of people are there, just over a third. When we actually see some people have improved, but they're not fully well, we can add those two and say, well, that's roughly three quarters. That's 75%. Uh, but we're left with 25% who have essentially not benefited from the standard treatments. And these essentially are the people that look towards other uh, treatment opportunities. And they are the people that deep brain stimulation um, has helped in some cases. Now, I'm not an anatomist. I'm not a neurologist, but I've learned uh, a little bit about um, the brain regions. And uh, we in psychiatry are particularly interested in areas like the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is actually an important part of our memory um, circuits in the brain. And just as an interesting aside, um, before we had global tracking in our uh, taxi cabs and so on, uh, a very interesting research project was done in London, in England, where the uh, brain scans of London taxi drivers were done and compared to uh, men or women of the same age who were not taxi drivers. And guess what? The hippocampus on either side was actually significantly larger in the taxi drivers who literally had to be full of memory for the complex streets of London. So I think the satellites have probably made that less of an issue. But there are important areas in terms of the brain. The amygdala is an area that tends to be involved in anxiety and fear. And we have an area, a large area, uh, called the cingulate cortex, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more of. Now, this is actually uh, a very simple uh, picture to make a point here. 
uh, Glenda McQueen and her colleagues at McMaster University have been looking at chronic recurrent depression, the size of the hippocampus, and memory function. And this is a person here who is a normal, non-depressed, middle-life male. And this is a matched, depressed person with chronic recurrent depression. And you can see a shrunken hippocampus. Now the question, of course, is when we find effective treatments, do we actually reverse the size? So depression is about uh, brain s structures and indeed even the size of some of the structures, but it's also about how different brain areas send signals from one region to another. Now this part I showed you earlier, the cingulate is very important in some of the work that we've been doing. The Latin students will know that nucleo or uh, genu is the knee. Uh, so this is the subgenual area here of the cingulate. And for reasons that I'll just briefly explain, this is actually the target area for people with depression in our center who've received treatment. Uh, just to make the point, these arrows really spell out that different brain regions send signals. This is the frontal cortex area, uh, and they receive signals from other brain regions. Now, why did we uh, focus in on this anterior cingulate area? Well, Helen Mayberg, um, actually just before she came to Toronto, did a very interesting set of experiments. She asked healthy volunteers if they'd be willing to have a PET scan. And a PET scan is a a way of taking uh, a, almost a radioactive picture of the brain in action, taking up glucose or with uh, radio-labeled water in the blood. But basically what she showed is that when healthy volunteers were asked to feel sad, this area called cingulate 25 was activated. The red means it increased its uptake of blood of glucose. Um, the second part of the experiment was to look at patients who had a depressive illness and were successfully treated with fluoxetine or Prozac, one of the main antidepressants of the last decade. And guess what? This singular area 25 went down in its activity. So up when you're sad, down when you're treated. Um, with other colleagues uh, here in Toronto, we also looked at uh, uh, treatment with another antidepressant called Effexor or venlafaxine, and we found exactly the same thing, that with a reduction in the depressive symptoms, we showed a marked reduction in the activity in this cingulate area. So logically, this became the target site for the deep brain stimulation. And again, I think uh, patients can tell the story uh, better than I can. And this is actually uh, a patient who was part of the uh, W5 uh, program recently talking about her depression. Sorry. Um, it's 